Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Jay Cost, contributing editor at the Weekly Standard. His last book, A Republic No More, Big Government and the Rise of American Political Corruption, was the subject of a previous Free Thoughts episode. His new book is The Price of Greatness, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and the Creation of American Oligarchy. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Jay. Thank you for having me, Trevor. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'd like to start from a, with a quote you have in the conclusion of the book, which is, For all the ostensible public spiritedness in today's government, we the people have a stark lack of confidence in the Republican project. Average citizens do not feel as though the government really represents them. Instead, it seems to speak for the special interests. Even though we are all entitled to vote for federal offices on the second Tuesday of November and even numbered years, it seems as though the government does not much belong to us. That quote describes how you say why the story of Madison and Hamilton remains vital. So can can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. Um, I think that, uh, you know, people today have this sort of anxiety about, you know, as I said in the book, in the conclusion there, that the government doesn't belong. Like it, it sort of is almost like sand slipping through our fingers, you know, a sense of control. And that while we have a formal, formal authority over the institutions of government through the franchise that for all intents and purposes, um, you know, power is effectively exercised by a smaller, you know, wealthy clique, right? Which in in the purposes of the subtitle I called oligarchy. And that is a very old anxiety in the American body politic. I mean, it, it, you can trace sort of those kinds of fears back through the progressive movement, the populist movement, um, Lincoln's Republican party in the 1850s sort of felt that way. Um, And it also goes back to this battle uh, in the early government in the first, second and third Congress between James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and Madison's worry that the government had effectively been captured. And while the, the people retained the formal control over the institutions that for all intents and purposes, purposes, an economic elite based primarily in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston were running the show, which I think is interesting, um, not just in the general sort of anxiety that Americans have about, oh, well, is this actually government of the people, by the people, for the people, but also that sort of persistent concern that the rich are actually in control, which is something that is a bipartisan concern nowadays. You know, I mean, you hear conservatives talk about the undue influence of the wealthy and they almost kind of in a lot of respects sound like you know ralph nader supporters so i think there's a persistent anxiety that the early american history really can speak to and and as we as we had discussed before we actually started recording with madison and hamilton that there's just this kind of mystery so to speak about friends and then enemies and and unfortunately we don't really have a, a total third act to that story due to Hamilton's untimely death in 1804 but at the beginning they they first meet when do they first meet they first meet in 1781 or 82 uh when they're both serving in the Congress of the Confederation or what basically was the Continental Congress the sort of the national assembly prior to the constitution that sort of you know from the enactment of the Articles of Confederation in 1776 to the first Congress meeting in 1789, the national government was, for all intents and purposes, this Congress of the Confederation. Uh, Madison is a delegate from Virginia, and Hamilton is a delegate from New York, and that is where uh, where the two of them first cross paths. And w- and would they have would they have agreed a lot at that time, at least in terms of what they thought about? the government at the time and, and its inadequacies. Yes, they would. And they had um, different backgrounds that sort of drove them to that point. Um, Hamilton had experience. He was, had served as aide de camp for general George Washington during the, during the war. And so had seen from that perspective, uh, the, the inability of the political class to really make do provisions for the military uh, and had been very frustrated that the that the Congress seemed impotent and incapable of acting on all, all manner of things like it couldn't re- regulate commerce. It couldn't raise it couldn't tax. So it couldn't, 
you know, pay soldiers. It couldn't provide sufficient provisions for them, you know, munitions and clothing. If you ever look at those old pictures of, you know, from at Valley Forge and why are the soldiers at Valley Forge in such miserable shape? A lot of that got down to the impotence of the federal government and had really everything had been left up to the states. Um, and that was sort of Hamilton's experience. Madison's experience had come from it from a different perspective. Madison um, uh, was not um, a warrior. Uh, at least five foot four, a hundred pounds. I mean, the man was <laughs> not meant uh, to to be in military service, um, but had gone to had sort of uh, distinguished himself at service in in the Virginia House of Delegates in the Virginia Constitutional Convention uh, as a very sharp minded, pragmatic, thoughtful legislator who was really good at the details of getting, you know, how are we going to forge a coalition to get things done? And so Madison goes up to the, the Congress of the Confederation uh, and so sees the same problems that Hamilton sees, although he's seeing it from the political end. He's watching politicians in the Congress just sort of debate and the government sort of grind its gears to no ultimate purpose. So they're both very frustrated by the impotence of the the national government, and they're both involved in the uh, calling of the convention, if I remember correctly, in the in the Annapolis Convention of 1786 that didn't really happen, right? Uh, and then call- that's right. And prior to the Annapolis Convention, they had both worked. You know, they had both tried um, to make the. Co- the the confederation congress work like one of the strategies they said well you know the congress doesn't have the power to tax but the states can tax and if we get the states to enact a tax on our behalf then that would be that could effectively solve our financial problems so the two of them had worked together to put together an impost and to do that they offered little incentives for st- States like there was a debt relief for Virginia, which was very indebted. And then there was also for like Maryland, there was a land session because Maryland didn't have any Western territory. So they they put together this package of like, you know, uh, all basically a log roll. It was the first attempted log roll in American political history. And the whole thing falls apart because Rhode Island won't agree to it. And then New York, New York backs out and the whole thing falls apart by 1783. And the two of them had really sort of come to the conclusion, well, hey, you know, this isn't going to work. Um, this government isn't working. And they had had – Madison had had success uh, with George Washington at the so-called Mount Vernon Conference uh, with Maryland. So, so the idea being, well, the federal government can't regulate co- commerce, so maybe Maryland and Virginia could work together basically and hammer out what would – to, to modernize look very much like a treaty to handle the waterways on the Potomac so that they have this conference at George Washington's Mount Vernon and it's a success in Madison and Hamilton and Washington uh, start agitating. Well, hey, we should have a national convention between the states for um, for for an interstate commerce treaty. If the if the Confederation Congress won't do it, the 13 states could do it. And, and what ends up happening is that at Annapolis, five states end up set sending delegates, and they all are the nationalist states. Um, even Ma- Maryland, it's in Annapolis, but Maryland doesn't go. But the, so they can't actually get anything done because they don't have a quorum. But they released this report. You know, Madison and Hamilton writes the report, basically calling for a, a convention to revise the Constitution. And at the convention, as, as students of American history know, James Madison is often referred to as the father of the Constitution. So he came in uh, with a, a pretty big plan, and, and Hamilton was there too, but, but under somewhat different circumstances, both within his state delegation and with the ideas that he had uh, to try and put into effect. Yes, that's right. So Hamilton comes to the uh, Constitutional Convention uh, with with uh, two other delegates. There's three delegates to the New York Convention. There's uh, uh, John Yates and Robert Lansing and, and Alexander Hamilton. And Yancing and Lates are both sort of doing the bidding of New York Governor George Clinton. And the parochial interests of New York at this point in time were such that Clinton didn't want a stronger federal union. New York was basically on the rise economically and politically. And when New York had been in a weaker s- shape, uh, the federal government hadn't been there to assist it. So you know, Clinton doesn't want a stronger federal union. And what this means is, is that since the convention is, you know, voting at the convention is one state gets one vote, 
means Hamilton's consistently outvoted, and New York, for all intents and purposes, acts as an anti-federal state. And then, in addition to this, Hamilton has uh, what is a very traditional view of Republican government. The, historically speaking, uh, the sense of the way, how do you maintain a government that is Republican? It's not through a, a pure representative democracy where only the people rule. Instead, the, the more traditional view, dating back to Aristotle, was you need a mixture of governing institutions. So the, the landed aristocracy has to have a role through, you know, say, the House of Lords, and there should be hereditary monarch and then a popularly elected House of Commons. And the idea being that these three different branches will will ameliorate the defects of each style of government. The aristocracy is an inherently defective form of government, but so is monarchy and so is democracy. So if you put them all together, they'll balance one another out. Hamilton basically takes that view to the, Const the Constitutional Convention and says, hey, we can't have, you know, there's not going to be any hereditary government, government in the United States, but we're going to create the effect of it by having a Senate that's elected for life and is elected by an electoral college. So the Senate is going to be immune from public opinion and the president is going to be elected from life, separated from the people by actually two electoral colleges. So Hamilton wants to basically bring forth the classical model, uh, ditch the hereditary aspects of it. But it's also compared to the, the radicalism in the United States. It's a very, very conservative uh, form of government. And it really it goes off like a lead balloon. I mean, it, the, it, Hamilton basically takes a whole day in the middle of June to deliver his ideas and the convention. They don't even vote on it. They 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 listen to him and then they adjourn for the day and then they move on to their other business. And that speech kind of haunts Hamilton to some degree. They, it gets brought up a lot in the next 15 years. They're just like, oh, yes. remember remember Alexander's monarchy speech that he just wanted to have the British government again is essentially what at least the, the Jeffersons and the Madison said about it. Right. Well, what happens is, is that the convention has a vow. They take a vow of secrecy, basically, is what they do. Um, you know, it's a closed door session and they're not to speak to anybody during the proceedings and they're not to go. They didn't want word. It's basically like like a papal conclave. If you remember when Pope Benedict was elected and then more recently Pope Francis, it's similar to that. Right. They just keep going until you see the white smoke and then they're done. Uh, but Madison had taken detailed notes of the convention proceedings. Um, a couple other delegates did as well. Lansing took some notes and I think um uh, a couple other delegates took notes. Well, William Jackson from New Jersey was supposed to take notes, but he kind of well, failed on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's sort of formal convention. There's a formal proceedings of it, and they're they're not very helpful. Um, but uh, what what happens is is that after the new government gets started, Madison actually shares with Jefferson uh, his notes. Uh, Jefferson got an advance copy of them, so to speak. And Madison otherwise kept them hidden and didn't share them with the public. It was only after his death that they were published, and so we have these notes. Now, he had planned for them to be published after his death, and the idea being that Madison was the last of the delegates to the convention to be alive. So now that he's dead, the notes are there, everybody's dead, so now it's there for all to see. But Madison shares with Jefferson these notes, and Jefferson and Madison are you know, sort of connect these dots and decide that, oh, Hamilton is actually a monarchist and wants to destroy the re Republican experiment. <laughs> but before before they that sort of animosity grows, we have uh, Madison and Hamilton being the, the lead authors of the Federalist Papers in terms of advocating for the Constitution. So even though they didn't have the exact frame of government in mind when they went into the convention, they both became supporters of it. Uh, and and you, you argue that, that although it seems like they're buddy buddy in in the federalist papers you can start to see the nascent parts of their disagreement in those especially with federalist 10 which is written by madison is kind of the one that you read in seventh grade history class right and then federalist 11 which is written by hamilton and in those two essays you see the the emerging disagreements yeah that's right um well at least that's what i think so i i think that's right um and i i think that it's it's important to sort of appreciate um that the two of them agreed in the 1780s because they they thought that the 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 government under the Articles of Confederation was too impotent, so the government had to be empowered. But the question then becomes, okay, empowered to do what? 
And my argument in the book is that the two of them had com competing views about what what should a strong Republican government do? What is it supposed to look like? And I, and I think the best analogy for, for listeners is to think of, of, of uh, Madison's view of Republican government as acting sort of like a referee. Right. In, a, in a game of football, the referee is the one who has the rule book, and his job is to apply the rules impartially without regard to whether or not the, you know, which team he's, he might root for when he's at home or, uh, or which players are on his fantasy football team that he's supposed to be a neutral arbiter, right? And Madison, one of Madison's complaints about the Congress of the Confederation was that it was not a neutral arbiter because it was so incapable of getting anything done, power re returned to the states, and the state governments treated political minorities with real disregard, and they also acted without regard to the national interest. So the, the, the state governments were partial. They were not impartial, right? And so Madison's idea was, well, we need a stronger federal authority to tax, to regulate interstate commerce, to, uh, you know, provide for the military, uh, negotiate treaties and do all of these things in such a way that they benefit the nation, generally speaking, without playing favorites. This was sort of the sine qua non for Madison of Republican government. Hamilton has a different view. Um, Hamilton's view is if, if Madison sort of sees Republican government as acting like um, a, a referee or umpire, Hamilton instead sort of sees the government acting like the head coach. The job of the head coach is to really coordinate the individuals on the team toward the shared goal of victory. Now, and so for all intents and purposes, what that means is, you know, you're going to play your star, you know, running back and your star quarterback and your star defensive lineman. And there's other players who are just going to ride the bench because that's what's good for the whole team. And in Hamilton's view, the stars of the government were going to be the, the wealthy. Right. Uh, because what Hamilton, you know, what and also I guess it sort of lends the question. So what would victory be for Hamilton? Victory would be securing the nation's economic and national security interests against the various European powers, because it's important to remember that all of the European powers are all still pretty much around. The French are in the West. Uh, the British are in the West. The Spanish are in the South. I mean, they're sort of. America has secured its independence and with the Treaty of Paris in 1783 has a level of security. But, you know, the history of Europe it illustrates that that's never, you know, not a necessarily durable. And there were still the United, British forts out in the, in the exactly. West. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that was the, part of the problem is, is that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the British, the terms of the Treaty of 1783, had promised to basically abandon its forts in present-day Detroit, and they hadn't done that, right? So Hamilton is interested in securing the, the nation, particularly in the foreign realm, and what that means is creating a strong financial foundation for the country's economic growth and diversification. Because, you know, part of the issue, too, is that the United States had been under the mercantilist system of Great Britain, where the... the Parliament had basically for centuries had basically imposed on America a you know, unimodal form of economy, basically in agriculture, and they weren't even allowed to manufacture goods that British manufacturers made. So Hamilton has a very far-sighted uh, notion of economic development in his mind, and, and he wants to use the federal government to do that. And what that is going to mean for Hamilton in the short term is – playing favorites, that the country was very cash poor at this point. Um, you know, another consequence of British economic uh, policies that the colonists had never been able to, you know, uh, print, not print, but coin hard currency or specie. So the country had never had a good monetary system. Uh, and so Hamilton wants to take the handful of people in the country, like, you know, your Robert Morris, your Governor Morris, your Philip Schuyler, you know, the sort of the wealthy commercial elite on, in the big cities of the Northeast and use their wealth to create a financial foundation for economic growth. But as a consequence of that, these men were going to become incredibly wealthy. I mean, you think from Madison's perspective, that kind of favoritism just does not square with his kind of republicanism.
Yeah, and you and you discuss uh, the the first big controversy after the new government is created, and and Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury, and James Madison is in the House of Representatives. That that Hamilton wants to, but but Madison is kind of the liaison with the administration too. He's a little bit more than just a House member, and Hamilton wants to create a national bank, uh, and the the controversy that erupts over that has something to do with the Constitution and whether or not it's constitutional, but also those fears that you, you articulated that Madison had about privileging this sort of wealthy elite that Hamilton viewed as a tool rather than a harm. Right. And I think it's this is sort of one of the ways in which um, I diverge from other scholars and writers about Madison is that I, I tend to view his – his constant for 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 a man who is, although he denied the title, but he has since been sort of granted the title, father of the Constitution. Um, his constitutional hermeneutic, the way that he would interpret and apply the Constitution, was not very consistent over the course of his political career. Um, it usually instead tracked with his main policy objectives. So in the case of the uh, in the case of the Bank of the United States, Madison makes the point that, you know, look, the the Constitutional Convention considered granting a charter to, um, you know, g- giving giving the federal government the power to grant charters and they voted it down. So that means it's not constitutional. Um, and, and Hamilton sort of makes what is, in effect, a common law argument saying, well, no, the necessary and proper clause opens the way to do this. And. I mean, we can have that debate till the cows come home, but I, it's it's worth noting, though, that Madison, at the end of his tenure in the House of Representatives, had uh, advocated for chartering a national university in Washington, D.C., had presented a petition on behalf of these people who wanted to sort of fund a national university and that it really required the federal government issuing some sort of charter and you know so there's a there there's an inconsistency there at least at first blush and i think that it, it's important to appreciate that for madison something else was going on with the bank of the united states that madison was worried that the bank of the united states was uh, ba- basically going the way it was designed was going to be extremely one-sided in its favoritism Particularly, particularly to people who owned government debt certificates. And at this point, I think it's important to remember that government debt had increasingly been concentrated in the hands of just a few speculators on the eastern seaboard. And it also had become concentrated and would increasingly become concentrated in foreign capitals, like in the Netherlands particularly. And the way the bank was structured was such that for uh, it to buy a share in the Bank of the United States, you had to put you had to pay four hundred dollars. But only a hundred of the that four hundred dollars had to be paid in hard currency or specie and government basically gold coin. Right. The remaining three hundred dollars could be paid in government debt certificates. And this. So what happens is, is that those people who owned the government debt were going to be basically given a 75% discount on what was a guaranteed moneymaker. I mean, everybody knew that the Bank of the United States was going to be a runaway success because it had the backing of the federal government. And prior to this, Hamilton had also uh, imposed uh, what was a assumption of the state debt. So basically, Hamilton had said, you know, if you have a debt certificate that you, is, is payable by the state of Connecticut, the federal government will, for all intents and purposes, take on that debt. And so, again, this was a way for people who just a couple of years ago for pennies on the dollar had purchased, you know, state debt, could then transform that state debt into federal debt and then use that as 75 percent of the payment for uh, Bank of the United States stock. And, and the other thing that's going on here is that there was prior to the release of Hamilton's program an increase in the price of government debt certificates, which is illustrative of the fact that people in the financial community, because they were close to Hamilton, knew what he was planning to do and so went out and purchased government debt from people who were not in the know. And that included members of Congress like Jeremiah Wadsworth, uh, who was from Connecticut, who sent you know emissaries down to the Carolinas, trolling through the backcountry of the Carolinas, 
purchasing debt from Revolutionary War veterans and their widows, like and we're talking like pennies on the dollar. These wealthy sort of politicians would buy this debt and come back up to, to Washington or excuse me, to New York and basically reap a huge windfall profit. And Madison's object, objection was like, hey, this is not the way Republican government is supposed to function. Republican government in Lincoln's sort of telling is supposed to be of government of the people, by the people and for the people. And in Madison's view, this was government of the speculators, by the speculators, for the speculators. Yeah, and the, the, the amount of members of Congress that seem to be involved and also some shady characters like William Dewar, uh, who is a friend of Hamilton and assistant secretary of the Treasury uh, at one point. But that, that debate that happened between also the national debt and the assumption of the state debts uh, dealt with, A, like veterans versus speculators, and then also the question that the states were not exactly on the same footing in terms of how much they had paid down their own debts. So just forgiving the debts would seem to punish the states that had done a better job of paying down their own debts. And the weird thing about it, because you do a better job in the book of, of anyone of explaining the ins and outs of that is, is that, you know, some of the people were saying it might be a good idea to assume the state debts, but we should do an accounting first to figure out where they sit and how much they've paid down. Whereas the Hamiltonians were saying now, 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 now. And it seems like speculation might have been behind that. Yeah, I think that speculation was a crucial ingredient, uh, especially in determining the final vote in the House of Representatives. Hamilton was not himself the speculator. Um, Hamilton had a very terrible judgment when it came to ha- people who were around him, right? You mentioned William Dewar. Hamilton names William Dewar to be the first ass- assistant secretary of the Treasury, and Dewar is there. Uh, through the summer and fall of 1789, while Hamilton's writing these reports, very quietly on the side, William Dewar is working basically to sell government debt to the Dutch based upon his foreknowledge of what Hamilton was going to propose. Hamilton, Dewar go, Dewar creates basically the first international banking syndicate based in the United States is what his ambition was. Dewar goes to the Dutch or he, he and his clique go to the Dutch and say, Hey, we know what's going to happen with the with the domestic debt. So you should buy domestic debt from us for pennies on the dollar, and then you can set, sell it for a big bounty. While Dewar is simultaneously helping Hamilton uh, draft this plan, and the part of the problem is as well is that this sort of double dealing is illegal now. But remember, this is when the government first got started. And while there was among many statesmen like Madison and Hamilton and Washington, a sort of gentlemanly ethic about never making a private profit off of public service, that that this is and we remember the sort of the people on the money, so to speak, you know, all, you know, Jeffrey, all the all the big people that we build monuments to really tended not to do things like that. But that's not the case for all of them. A lot of them were simultaneously, while they were legislating on the disposition of Western land, they'd be speculating on Western land. And in the case of Hamilton's financial program, you had all sorts of people who were speculating in in Western land. So there was this real sort of sense that conflicts of interest were undermining the Republican foundation of the government and that the government and people who were elected to serve the public interest were instead going to the Capitol and serving, lining their own pocketbooks. And there was a belief that this was Jefferson and Madison believed that this made the difference, that if people had taken a vote based upon the honest concerns of their constituents, that the debt assumption would not have happened until after you said a final accounting, because states like Virginia had after, you know, had been very indebted from the war, but had made efforts to sort of pay down their debts. And the assumption plan really benefited just three states. It was basically 10 states subsidizing three states, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and South Carolina, uh, all of whom had their economies were really particularly depressed after the war, in part because they had been central cogs in the British mercantile system. And now having been shut out of that mercantilistic empire, they, their economies took a real hit. So they were deeply in debt. And the view of Madison and uh, people from like Virginia and William McClay was a senator from Pennsylvania was sort of like, hey, you know, we'll pay. We should assume the debts because, you know, the, the revolution was funded by the 13 states, but it was really a national endeavor. So everybody should pay their fair share. But we have to figure out what that fair share is. 
And Hamilton's plan did not call for that. It called for an immediate assumption. And that mattered uh, because a lot of, you know, what happened was that a lot of the speculators in Congress didn't, didn't want to wait. They wanted an immediate assumption because they had leveraged themselves to go out and buy state debt. So if, if you imagine yourself, you're a speculator, and you go down and you buy debt from North Carolina and you do it on margin – and James Madison is saying, well, we need to wait two years and figure this out. Well, I can't wait two years. I'll be ruined in two years. I'll get sent to debtor's prison if, I, if we wait two years. We've got to do this now, 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 now. And you see in Madison's private correspondence, just this – at first, he is just completely gobsmacked by this. He talks again and again, writing to Edmund Pendleton and James Monroe, just the vehemence – of the of the assumption crowd why do they want this now what is driving them the ultimate answer that he comes up with and i think he was correct was private gain and it's interesting too that they didn't seem to transfer some of that uh animosity toward the the stock jobbers as they would call them to, to hamilton yes uh, and 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 I think then they remember the speech from the convention, and maybe that's when Madison shares his notes and says, "Oh, we knew all the time that Hamilton was a wolf in sheep's clothing." Who, who right? Even yeah, it, yeah. It's unfortunate in in a lot of respects that for not just for Hamilton, whose reputation was sullied, but Madison and Jefferson were just wrong about Hamilton. And so when we look at the full historical record, you see their error. They have in, since particularly in the last 50, 60 years, have been criticized for being too harsh on Hamilton. And he never uh, made any money at all. He actually was, never was made mad, any money. bad no, at that. He never yeah. made any money. Um, but what they thought, so that these are the pieces that they connected together. Their feeling was is that Hamilton was basically creating a system where he was using federal policy as a patronage, basically as a slush fund. Debt policy is a kind of slush fund to buy members of Congress and put them in his pocket. And to them, this looked an awful lot like the way the crown, the British crown, operated after the Glorious Revolution. After the Glorious Revolution, the crown's ability to raise revenue and operate independent of parliament was severely curtailed. But in the radical Whig a criticism of the of the of the of the Hanover of the Hanover crown under George I and George II, such as Cato's, idea, Cato's letters, which is what we're named after. Right. Yeah. After Cato's letters, the, the the argument of Trenchard and Gordon, who are the authors of Cato's letters, was basically that the crown was using the civil list, which was its basically its ability to, um, you know, basically to bribe members of parliament to vote for the the crown's agenda so that the crown was effectively undermining the, the the sovereignty of parliament by exploiting conflicts of interest and madison and hamilton looked at that example and said well here's hamilton acting like robert walpole the prime minister doing the bid bidding of the crown he must have the same end in mind he must if he's using the same methodology he must have the same goal which is ultimately to corrupt congress and corrupt the the uh, the people's representatives, and you know, turn put basically put them in his pocket so he can control them. Which it doesn't that look an awful lot like monarchy. So by 1791 and 1792, this really becomes the sort of the conclusion of the Jeffersonians. And if you look at Madison's essays and for the National Gazette, they were written on they were unsigned essays. But that's pretty much much what Madison was arguing. And, and so throughout the 1790s, we, we see this partisanship, uh, which begins in these controversies and then moves over into foreign policy with the Jay Treaty and the XYZ affair and the quasi war with France. And at that time, Hamilton, by that later 1790s, he's out of the government. Right. Um, but with the foreign policy disputes, which were just as vehement, if not more so, than the domestic policy. Do those map well to this you know, kind of view of national greatness that we're talking about? Or was it really just England versus France? I mean, that... No, there really is an overlap, which is interesting because you're right. The uh, the domestic policy really more or less is just, it, it, just, it continues to sort of resonate through the decade, through the 1790s. But Hamilton's economic agenda basically is completed by 1792. Um, at the end of 1791, he proposes uh, uh, tariffs on manufactured goods and bounties to protect domestic industries. But that doesn't go anywhere, and that's pretty much it. And then this sort of crisis with the Napoleonic Wars 
and the well later on the Napoleonic Wars, but the Fr- France and England declare war on each other in 1793, and the United States is basically caught between a rock and a hard place. And hey, the Federalists under Hamilton are pro- partial to the British, and the Repu- Republicans, the Jeffersonians under Madison and Jefferson, are partial to the French. Um, and you know, a lot of this ends up getting sort of said, well, you know, this is because the French were revolution, Republican revolutionaries and that was, you know, Madison and Jefferson were partial to that. And there's some of that is true, but it also sort of gets to this economic disagreement that the two of them had and where the United States stood vis-a-vis the rest of the world, right? And remember, one of the reasons that Hamilton wanted to implement this program because he thought that the United States economically was weak, um, and that he, it, it had the capacity, like if you read Federalist 11, Hamilton's basic argument is that the United States has the capacity, the potential to be a strong nation, but it is not yet strong, right? And so when the war between Britain and France begins, um, you know, Great Britain is America's number one trading partner. And so Hamilton thinks it would be foolhardy to, uh, you know, anger America's number one trading partner because the British, you know, remember at this point, you know, tax revenue is primarily through imported goods, imposts or tariffs. And so Britain is basically subsidizing the federal government at at this point. And remember, because the federal government is is the backstop for the Bank of the United States, Britain is by extension subsidizing Hamilton's entire financial architecture depends upon a steady stream of imported goods coming from Great Britain. So Hamilton says, my God, we can't offend Great Britain. We have to sort of, you know, um, we have to sort of stay on their side. And Madison has a different view. Madison's view is that, well, you know, look, we provide food to Great Britain and Great Britain provides, you know, manufactured goods to us. And we they we need them or I should say they need us more than we need them. We can go without British glassware and cookware, but if if we stop sending them our grain, they will starve. So Madison's view was, no, we should drive a hard bargain with the British. And Hamilton said, oh, that's insane. They could utterly destroy us. And so and so the, the dispute between the two, and I think it's important to remember the two of them never had had an occasion during this entire period of time to sit down and dispassionately sort of see where the others stood. So they end up becoming enemies, political enemies. And so it's just sort of hyperbole upon hyperbole and the two misunderstanding each other and getting worse and worse. So Madison infers from Hamilton's what he thinks is sort of his knee jerk defense of Britain as a just a further sign that Hamilton wants to initiate a British style of government in the United States. And Hamilton looks at Madison's defense and says, you know, he's just, uh, you know, he uh, in one letter, he says Madison has a womanly attachment to France. So the two of them are basically talking across each other and had been so by the time Jay's treaty is signed in 1795. They had really been talking across each other for five years at this point. So skipping forward. So we have the election of 1800 when the John Adams loses to Jefferson. And then after that, we have uh, 25 years of Virginia rule, so to speak, mm-hmm. where where the Jeffersonians, Republicans become one party and Federalists almost disappear. And of course, Hamilton dies in 1804. And the other part you bring out in the book is that when the when the Jeffersonians, meeting Jefferson himself first, and then Madison, and then Monroe, take over the government, they start trying try to do some of these things that they thought were were going to be good ideas. So Jefferson tries to embargo his own people from trading with Great Britain because he thought it would hurt them more than our than our people, and he was pretty wrong about that. Yeah, that's sort of the second act kicker in the book. I I, I like to think if it's, if it's a story in three acts, the second act kicker is that Hamilton turned out to be right um, about many they things. Try, they try a couple things, right? They try Madison's idea of well, you know, let's drive a hard bargain with the British, right? It doesn't work. Um, and they try an embargo, and they're smuggling, and you know, particularly the, the Madison is eyeing the British West Indies, saying they, they need our food. Right. If we stop supply because they couldn't grow food in the West Indies, they grew sugar, but they had to import their food. If we drive a hard bargain with the British, we can basically starve the West Indies. But it didn't happen. Right. And, and the War of 1812 comes 
And it turns out Britain's a lot stronger than Madison had anticipated. And on top of that, the, the main sort of plank of Hamilton's financial system was the Bank of the United States. And Jefferson, as president, had at several points said, you know, I want to get rid of this thing. And Albert Gallatin, who sort of, if, if Jefferson had a brains trust, it was basically Madison and Albert Gallatin, who was a Swiss-born um, uh, congressman from Pennsylvania, and he was a Republican through and through, uh, but really appreciated the brilliance of Hamilton's economic system. And, ha and Gallatin points out to Jefferson in a letter, says, look, you know, we can't get rid of the Bank of the United States. We're opening all this land out in the West uh, for purchase, and we need a place to collect tax revenue and people to pay their bills, and we need the bank, right? And the, if you want to accomplish this, you know, what Jefferson had once called an empire of liberty, right, spreading into the interior of the continent, we need a good, stable financial system to make that happen. And before the Federal Reserve, you had the Bank of the United States, so we can't get rid of it, right? Um, and he stays Jefferson's hand. Now, in 1811, the bank is up for recharter, and Gallatin tries to get it rechartered. And Madison doesn't come out one way or another, which I think is one of his biggest mistakes. Um, I think maybe his pride got the better of him, and he couldn't actually tell Congress, you should vote for the recharter. And so the bank doesn't get rechartered. And they go into the War of 1812, and sure enough, Hamilton's predictions turn out to be true. Without the Bank of the United States, the government can't raise money. That, I mean, that was one of the main arguments that Hamilton made for the Bank of the United States, is that the bank will be there if the government needs money in a pinch, and the bank's not there. And so the government ha – hey, how is the government going to raise supply, raise funds to supply its troops? Well, they had to go and make these short-term loans at very high interest rates. Uh, additionally, the War of 1812 was very unpopular in the Northeast, where there was a lot of capital was sort of located in the Northeast. So lenders in the Northeast are disinclined to sell, to, to loan to the United States. So there's a, there's a credit crunch. Um, and so ultimately, Madison and the Republicans realized that, you know, we have to play favorites a little bit because we can't have – Republican government if we just end up being a, tribu a tributary of Great Britain again, which is, frankly, almost what happened in the War of 1812. I mean, the United States, if the United States had not won the Battle of Plattsburgh, you know, upstate New York and, frankly, Maine and Vermont, any parts of New Hampshire might have ended be part of present-day Canada. You know, I mean, that was how close uh, matters came. You know, if, if, if Jackson hadn't won in the Battle of New Orleans— uh, you know, even though that was after the Treaty of Ghent, who knows? You know, the United, you know, present day New Orleans might be some, you know, not part of the United States. And that's the interesting thing is that in the after the war, Madison changes his tune, so to speak, on on three things you point out. And, and another thing you point out that I hadn't really heard before, and I've read a lot of uh, biographies of Madison, is that he had this sort of proto Malthusian theory of of how much uh, people could supply food for themselves uh, uh, with with agriculture. And of course, he and Jefferson both had this utopian you know, fixation on farming, uh, which always struck me as kind of odd uh, and not really liking manufacturing, and, and which is something that Hamilton liked. He, he wanted more industry and stuff like that. And by the end of the war, the last two years of Madison's presidency, uh, he reauthorizes the bank, uh, even though he didn't do it originally. Uh, he puts internal improvements into fact arts championing canals and infrastructure, and then also protecting American industry via tariffs, which is another thing that that uh, that Hamilton had, had advocated for. Yeah, that's right. And it, it speaks to the tariff issue really speaks to another sort of flip-flop. I mean, Madison flip-flops on the Bank of the United States, but the tariff issue is also flip-flop. Because again, in his sort of Malthusianism gets back to this idea of, you know, Britain can't feed itself, right? So we, we are stronger than Great Britain because Britain can't feed itself. Um and then, and Hamilton sort of makes the point, uh, you know, look, Britain has a diversified economy. They're going to be fine. You know, they're going to figure out a way around, you know, whatever, you know, whatever commercial discrimination we impose upon them. Britain is going to figure out a way around it and because they have a diversified economy. And so the tariff of 1816 is sort of Madison's acknowledgement uh, that Hamilton was right, that the government has to, in a way – in some way intervene to diversify the economy and that and and then you kind of put it together with that 
I don't know if it's the beginning, the the end up through Monroe, and then we get John Quincy Adams, and we get Jackson. So that's that kind of puts everything back a different way. But but starting at that point, the idea of tariffs and internal improvements and the government operating in a in a fairly Hamiltonian way was broadly held by the by the Republicans, so to speak. And it took Jackson and going against the tariff and going against the Second Bank of the United States to kind of bring back these Madisonian views that Madison himself had a, had kind of abandoned. Yeah, that's right. It's a big reason why I don't like to use the phrase that that's often used to describe the Jeffersonians. They're often called the Democratic Republicans. Uh, that's a neologism. Um, because the Republican, the Jeffersonian Republicans basically split into two factions. One became the Whigs, one became the Republicans, or one became the Democrats. Uh, but yeah, so you're, that's sort of what I like to call the third act kicker of the, of the book. The second act kicker is, well, gee, Hamilton was right. We need all this national development stuff. It turned out Madison was right too, that this national development stuff lends itself to corruption, which is what Andrew Jackson was complaining about, that, um, and John C. Calhoun as well, that the tariff ends up, the tariff not of 1816, uh, the tariff of 1816 was a pretty reasonable tariff law. Uh, but by 1824, and especially the tariff of 1828, the tariff becomes just this basically a log roll for the Midwest and the Northeast to basically rob the South is what it was. And, they, and the South knew that. <laughs> and the South knew that, which is why that's where the nullification crisis comes from. Right. The South's argument is, is is the Jeffersonian sort of Republican idea of it is that, you know, Republican government and it gets back to sort of the Constitution grants Congress to lay and collect taxes for the general welfare. Right. So the tariff of 1828 in the Southern argument, and I think they were correct, is that this is manifestly not a law that works for the general welfare. It enriches some regions of the country at the expense of others, and therefore it is null and void. Now, putting aside the null and void argument and sort of we can disagree with Calhoun's solution while also acknowledging that the South had some legitimate beefs with the tariff of 1828. But this is exactly what Madison's original anxiety was, this sort of uh, that kind of nationalism that Hamilton had envisioned can be awfully one-sided. And and oftentimes people can operate under sort of a nationalist guise. Say, well, I'm really just working for the interests of the country. And it's like, well, no, actually, you're just trying to line your own pocket. Right. This was a major complaint that Madison and Jefferson and Gallatin had leveled at Hamilton. And it really kind of resurfaces in the 1820s because that's sort of what happens. And it resurfaces over and over again. That's that's the, the kind of conclusion that they bo- yeah, they both and, were and, right. And and one, you know, the other thing, too, is that, you know, that Madison had been a skeptic of financial federally sanctioned financial institutions like the Bank of the United States. So the way to understand Madison's apparent divergence on a national university and a national bank is just think about, you know, in his view, a national university would obviously be for the good of the whole country because it would promote learning and scholarship and education. But the history of federal of nationally or publicly chartered banks in Europe suggested that they could become political powers, right? Actually, the financial grants that they get, you know, money and power are kind of fungible, and the bank could act, uh, banks could actually start influencing politics. And this is exactly what happens with the Second Bank of the United States. Which is a disaster uh, it, in many ways. It, in many ways, it was a disaster. It, in its early years, the bank lended with gross irresponsibility and had basically become captured by the stockholders who, who looked to line their own pockets, and it, it didn't cause the Panic of 1819, but it made it worse. And, it, in, and the irresponsibility leading up to that economic p- panic meant that th- when the bank, when the panic came, the bank's financial house was not in order. So Langdon Chevis, who was the president of the bank, had to uh, impose this contraction to get the bank in place first, which, you know, in an economic contraction, you want public institutions to begin to lend money and make credit more easily available to sort of cut against this contraction of private credit. Well, the bank, the, the second bank made that worse. And a lot of that happened was because of the corruption. And then during um, at the end, when Jackson was fighting the bank, uh, President Nic- Nicholas Biddle actually used his the bank's resources to to campaign on behalf of Henry Clay. 
So here you have the, 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 the corner piece, the cornerstone of the Hamiltonian financial engine being used in these anti-Republican ways, just as Madison had feared. So if, if Madison's presidency had demonstrated that Hamilton's was right, the aftermath of Madison's presidency demonstrated that Madison's original critiques were right, too. They were both right. And that's the, the irony there is that the, the bank that Madison opposed, the first bank of the United States, was was fairly well run in terms of corruption. Uh, and the bank that he chartered was not. Was <laughs> so, he was, yeah. so he was, was right a, about was the disaster. one the one he created. And that and that kind of, I guess, like puts the whole thing in perspective that in and I suggest listeners and, and readers go listen to the other episode we do with you about a republic no more, because then you do have this corruption that happens throughout American history in ways that Madison predicted. But you also have Hamiltonian national projects that that are often worth undertaking for right. reasons that Madison didn't understand. We were not going to be a country of only farmers uh, with the government just doing this uh, basic farm policy, I guess. And it kind of, I don't, I mean, it, it does, as I, we said at the outset, it, it, those two men together have a way of explaining not only American history, but the debates we're having today. Right. And it sort of, so that's where the title of the book comes from. So, so what is the price of greatness, right? The, the pr greatness in the Hamiltonian sense, in the sense of Federalist 11, where he, he envisions one great American system. What is the price of one great American system? Well, the price is we have to suffer a certain kind of oligarchy, right? We have to, you know, to, to be great in a way requires the government to play favorites in the long run, to yield or uh, to play favorites in the short run to yield long-term benefits. But doing so ends up empowering the wealthy with a level of political power that they would not otherwise possess if they just if they if it was just left up to their votes. So the price of Hamiltonian greatness is a denial of Madisonian republicanism and an acceptance of a certain level of oligarchy or rule by the rich. So as we said at the outset, if, if a lot of people feel that they don't have representation in government and that it is an oligarchy and we're not getting mad some of Madison's conclusions, fears have come true, uh, what can we do about it? Uh, is it, is it time to, to we learn from these two thinkers and figure out how to fix it or make it take a different look at government, uh, or pass some amendments? Is there something we can do about? Yeah, I mean, look, there's all sorts of ways to to sort of tinker with things, and I'm and I'm and I'm not opposed to tinkering, <laughs> you know. Um, I think though that the first thing we need to do is we need to recognize the trade-off here. We need to be mindful of that. Um, we need to be mindful, especially with you know, even if even if the purpose if we're going to yoke the powers of the federal state for the purposes of an egalitarian project, right? Um, I think a great example of that would be the Medicare program, right? When Medicare was initiated in 1965, it was done with the most noblest of purposes for elderly people who were the poorest, most sort of pitiable demographic in the United States. And now, you know, um, what's ended up happening is we've created this behemoth in the medical services industry that has enormous influence over our politics because ultimately the federal government depends upon the medical services industry to carry out its agenda on Medicare, Medicaid, and other federal medical projects, right? And that that's sort of the downside of our great nationalistic endeavors is that whenever we eat, we say, well, we're going to do this great big thing, right? And we're going to em employ this particular faction to bring about this great purpose. Uh, and it could be a left-wing purpose like, you know, healthcare for all. It could be a right-wing purpose like, you know, capital gains, tax cuts to stimulate investment in the domestic economy. But when the government does things like that, it, it has to necessarily play favorites, Right. Capital gains, tax cuts, even if we believe that they ultimately serve the general welfare, we have to acknowledge that in the short term, they are basically windfall profits for capital owners. And that that partiality, that's a partiality that is, you know, problematic in a really kind of strict Republican sense. Right. Government is supposed to be neutral between people. So, you know, when we play favorites, we have to recognize that that's not really necessarily consistent with our Republican ideals. And in the long term, 
we also have to appreciate that when we play favorites today and we give certain groups benefits and say, we want you to use these benefits and go out and help the rest of the country, that the government in turn kind of becomes dependent upon those groups. And again, I think the, probably the best example of that would be the medical services industry, particularly the doctor's lobby, the AMA. The AMA wanted nothing to do with Medicare in the 1960s and had fought time and again since Truman's administration to stop any kind of universal health care program. And then finally, FDR, or excuse me, LBJ sort of shoves it down their throats in 1965. And now, you know, the AMA is arguably outside of the big banks is probably the most powerful interest group in the country. And that the AMA now has sign off on all manner of federal policies. But the AMA spends an enormous amount of money lobbying the government. And where do they get that money from? Well, ultimately, the money comes at least indirectly from federal subsidies like the Medicare program and the Medicaid program. Where the government is writing the doctor's checks. The doctors turn around and give their money to the AMA, which turns around to lobby the government to make sure that policies continue to be beneficial for the AMA. That this is the price of greatness. The price of greatness is creating interest groups that have a power over the government itself. And so we have to appreciate, I think, as a, pro pro as a, as a prologue to any kind of actual policy implementations, we have to appreciate that there is a trade-off here. And that should not only temper our nationalistic ambitions, I think, and we shouldn't always look to the government. Like, we shouldn't always look to the government to be the guarantor of egalitarian, of, of, a, of a equal egalitarianism, right? Because the government inherently plays favorites in almost everything it does. The government plays favorites. So why are we looking to the government as our egalitarian, you know, guarantor? But beyond that, we also have to be mindful that these policies that we create, like in the case of Medicare, they have this sort of recursive quality to them, and these policies can grow and mutate over time. And so as we are designing policies, we have to be mindful that they can evolve over time, like the Bank of the United States did, like the, the, the tariff did. That you know, It's one thing to initiate a tariff in 1816, but a decade later, the tariff mutated into something completely different. And we have to be mindful of that when we're building policies. And we, in general, need to be mindful that, you know, when we have these great nationalistic ambitions, we have to be careful of our Republican institutions and our principles, because those are especially fragile. They, history has demonstrated that they are especially able, especially susceptible to corruption and often corruption, not in form, but in substance. So we can all continue to go to vote. And it looks like we're actually in charge. But when people get to Washington, they they don't necessarily follow the public instructions because they're effectively captured by these muddied interests. And the, the corruption of Republican government is something that can happen subtly and can happen very easily. And we need to be mindful of that. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.